May the graciousness of the Lord our God be upon us. Amen. Please be seated. I like to mix it up once in a while. This is wonderful timing for this reading from Mark's Gospel as we head into the season of stewardship here at St. Stephen's. Oh, there has been nothing official yet as to how we are going to do it this year, but October and November are the months to get us thinking about our pledge for 2016. Let's face it, if the local NPR and PBS stations can do this several times a year, we certainly can concentrate on our own pledging this one time of the year. I know we hate to discuss money when it comes to church, but our stewardship involves more than just money. It is how we take care of this beautiful building, the grounds, and how we devote our time and talent to making things move in a positive way here at St. Stephen's. Every Sunday when I receive the offering plate and the basket of food, we offer thanks for the blessings that God has given us in our lives. We cannot give God a check or even cash, can we? We can pledge, however, give that promise to God that we'll do our best to take care of this community on behalf of God. That is pretty awesome. This story of the rich young man and Jesus is very familiar to us. It seems so unfair at first glance and hearing, right? The man, sometimes referred to as the rich young man, seems a rather decent sort. Excited about seeing Jesus on the road, the man ran up and knelt before him. Why did he kneel? Was he paying homage to a king, a lord, a man of nobility? Of course not. His actions spoke of one beseeching help from this man of great healing. The reputation of Jesus was all around the region of Judea and beyond Jordan, and crowds gathered around Jesus. This wealthy man was no different in this respect. He wanted answers, and he laid his hopes on this rabbi. Let's take a step back from the story and look at the characters. We have just come from Jesus admonishing his disciples that they must have pay attention to the children because the kingdom of God belongs to them. Jesus loved children and elevated them to a far greater importance than their society viewed them. He told us, his disciples, men of this society, that whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This was a tangible example of the points Jesus gave to them. Life is important. Children are important. Women are important. The disenfranchised are important. The impoverished are important. The unrecognized are important. How did this enter into the disciples' minds and hearts? The moments before, they had sternly ordered the kids to beat it. Could they have suddenly changed their understanding with these words of Jesus, even with his continued remarks about children? I think we've heard that about three weeks now. Now we have a wealthy man. Whether his money was inherited or this man had access to a business that provided him with his riches, we do not know. We do know, however, that in this society, wealth mattered. It was believed that God showed favor towards those who had money, land, animals, wives, and children. Remember the story of Job, who was also quite wealthy. This meant that the man was righteous, or he never would have received all of this wealth. The poor, in contrast, within this context, not only had a great lack in their material possessions, but God must not have had a very good opinion of them. And so they had nothing and were viewed as nothing. What Jesus does to this man must have shocked his disciples as well. This man told Jesus he followed the commandments and had done so since he was a child. He knelt in supplication to Jesus in a manner of respect. He even addressed Jesus as good teacher. 
This man was a shining example of all that was considered worthy in his day and age. Did Jesus treat him with equal respect? Well, on the surface, not exactly. Jesus seems rather snappy with him, doesn't he? Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Okay. Then he asks the man if he had followed the commandments, including one that is not even mentioned as one of the ten, do not defraud. Does Jesus know something about the other actions of this man? In Deuteronomy it is stated, You shall not withhold the wages of poor and needy laborers, whether other Israelites or aliens reside in your land in one of your towns. Could this man's wealth be supported through and by these means? The man protests that he has kept the laws. Jesus looks at him with an incredible insight that perhaps did reveal the man's true self. Even though Jesus may have sensed the outcome, Jesus loved him regardless. He gave the man an answer to his question and told him to exchange his material goods and possessions to risk comfort and protection against the unknown with the treasure in heaven and to follow him. But it was just too high a demand. The man could not give up his certainty and comfort to follow Jesus. His reaction, he walked away shocked and grieving. His perceived life of righteousness, righteousness was never the true answer. He had to choose his priority in life to love and serve the Lord by giving up his material possessions and his money to the poor. Again, it was just too much. Now the disciples were extremely perplexed. If this wealthy man, esteemed by his society and religion, was not able to follow Jesus, how could they ever have a chance to be saved? What is the true worth of a man? The disciples still believed the tenets of their religion and could not believe that Jesus was turning the tables on them again. Why would Jesus do such a thing? Jesus was on his journey to the cross, and he needed his disciples to truly understand. Now, without causing fear and trembling on your part, since I did mention stewardship at the beginning of this homily, how does this story relate to us today? Are we, and this includes all of us here at St. Stephen's, clergy and lay alike, are we being asked to give up everything of ours? There have been people throughout the centuries who have done such a thing. Think of St. Francis for one, and some who continue to do this today. That is not, not what is being asked of us, however. We are to give our whole attention and focus to our journey, our place on the way with God. We can treat church as a social aspect of our lives. Think back to the days when we were the elite, the frozen chosen. The ones that movies were made with David Niven and all of those movies. Or equate it with our other activities in life, such as skiing, sports, entertainment. Or we can give a sense of priority to our commitment to this community of St. Stephen's where we share our corporal worship of the God who loves us and gives us so many gifts that sustain us. Pastor Brian Stockman, a Lutheran pastor, said, Christianity is not a hobby among others, but a way of life. Our stewardship of this building, of this relationship with one another, and our gratitude to God must be an integral part of our lives. Without this, we may be the ones shocked, and we'll be the ones to go away grieving. Being on this journey with Christ is not a once upon a time bedtime story. In the letter to the Hebrews, we are given a pretty strong reality check. Indeed, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow, 
It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Thus, Jesus did see this wealthy man's heart and also understood his longing to find something deeper in his life. The message is not what the man had hoped for, and so he left. Jesus did give him a gift of awareness, however, and the man may still have found a way to detach himself from his possessions and position. There was and is hope. In this Gospel reading, the power of Jesus' words comes not just because he said them, but also because we know that he was on his way to give away all that he had, his own life. We need merely to ask ourselves, what are we willing to give to show our commitment to God and to this beloved community of St. Stephen's? So for us, this is the time to begin our prayers and thoughts about our 2016 pledge. But in the meantime, let us pray. Stephen Shakespeare. God of the narrow way, you call us to shed all that burdens the lightness of life. Help us to surrender false wealth. Embrace our need of you and live for your kingdom above all things. Through Jesus Christ, the richness of God. Amen.